Okay, we're going to start session 45 today uh, of the Book of John. And just want to welcome everybody as we start the 45th session. We're uh, at the last two chapters. You know, as we finished last week, chapter 19. Chapter 19 is where, is where we went through uh, the false trials, the, the beating that, that Christ took, and uh, actually his crucifixion. All that was in 18, a very, very tough chapter. It took us, you know, three sessions to get through that chapter. It's just so full of things. But one thing that we needed to be very uh, convinced of, and this is what we tried to convey to everyone last week, is that, that chapter ended, there should be no question that Christ died. He died for our sins, but you have all kinds of theories that he wasn't dead, he really wasn't true. I hope that you feel uh, committed to the conclusion that unequivocally you know he died. No one could have survived what he went through. He gave up his spirit, however. No one took his life from him. And that's what we learned. So as we go through, we remember that Joseph and Nicodemus uh, basically went and asked Pilate for his body. Other portions of the, uh, of the other Gospels say that uh, Pilate was surprised that he was dead so soon, sent a soldier out there to make sure he was dead. Soldier came back and said, yes, then he gave uh, Joseph uh, of our Arithmia the authority to go remove the body. So the Jews knew he was dead. The soldier that went out and, and saw him knew he was dead. The soldier that stuck him in his ribs, he's dead. John witnessed him. He was the only disciple that was there, was dead. The Marys witnessed him that he was dead. So there's absolutely no question as we leave 19 that Christ died and was buried. That's the way we left 19. Well, now we get into chapter 20. And as we start chapter 20, we'll probably cover this in, in two, two uh, sessions. But the fact is, now we're getting into the resurrection. And the resurrection is the core foundation to our faith. We'll recognize the first question here, why is the re resurrection the core to the Christian belief? And the, the fact is, you cannot have a Christian belief without the resurrection. So if Jesus did not uh, rise from the, the grave, we would have no religion. So as we look at, yes, he died, yes, he was buried, now was he resurrected? And we pull back some of our old Bible studies uh, on, on a study called the case for Easter. And so we have several questions coming in here for the case for Easter. First one is why is resurrection the core value of our beliefs? You know, number one is that it, it shows a serene vindication of his identity and his teaching. Proof of triumphs uh, over sin and death, foreshadowing of a resurrection for his followers. So we get to see what is that we have new bodies and we will be resurrected. So that's what it shows us. It's the basis for all of our Christian hope. It's a miracle of all miracles. So when you look at this, there's absolutely, when we talk about death and burial, this is probably the pinnacle of what we need to believe is that Christ rose. He's alive. That is the basis of our religion. So these next questions that we have um, that we're going to ask until we go into the script, the first scripture reading, come from uh, William Lane Craig, and he is a university and seminary professor and an author, and he's an expert on the resurrection. So these are questions and answers that he has developed, and we're just sharing those with you um, that let us know that the resurrection was accurate. So the next question was, the body really gone? Or was the resurrection simply a spiritual event? And the reason we're posing this question is because there are people that say, okay, well, well the resurrection was spiritual. It wasn't really physical. Um, anybody have any thoughts one way or the other? You want to vote on which way? I guess if anybody thinks that it was spiritual and not a true body resurrection, um, 
speak up. Otherwise, I'm going to assume all of you know that it was a physical resurrection. Right, so it is a physical re uh, resurrection. And, and how do we know this? First, um, we talked about the creed. And the creed is from a very early uh, writing. It's in Corinthians. It specifically says that Jesus died according to scripture. He was buried according to scripture. He was scripture. He rose on the third day and he was seen by people. And that's kind of, that is the Christian creed. And that's what we're going on. So that was written very, very early. Um, and it says that the tomb was empty. It didn't say that the tomb was without the spirit of Christ. It says the tomb was empty. Another thing is Jews had a very physical um, concept of resurrection. They believed in a physical resurrection. And so to the point as when they had a loved one that passed, um, X number of years or amount of time, I don't even know how long that is, where the flesh should have been uh, rotted off the bones and the bo just bones left, family members would go and go to that tomb or the grave. They would collect the bones, put them in a box and save them so that those bones would be ready when Christ's second, Christ's, well, we know as the second coming comes and they'd be ready for that resurrection when Christ comes to raise people from the dead and take them back to heaven. That was their belief. So they knew resurrection and it wasn't um, just a spiritual uh, event. Um, the, another thing is that the Jews never would have, the, the, earliest, um, the earliest manuscripts or writings, the word that they used for resurrection was the same word that they used for these bones resurrection. And if it was a spiritual event, there would have been a whole different word they used. They would not have used the same word. So all of these things let us know it was not just a spiritual event. It was a physical event and the body of Christ was missing from that grave. Yeah, and you know, Annette mentioned uh, Corinthians 15 where Paul's talking about the Christian creed. Uh, he also gets into the latter part of that chapter was it a spiritual, physical resurrection? And he basically puts it so strong is that if it wasn't a physical re uh, resurrection, then our belief in Christianity would be questioned. It was physical. He goes through and, and talks about ours, and he's explaining it to Corinth, the people of Corinth. So if you want to do more work there, you can go back to, to Corinthians, the first Corinthians 15, and look at what Paul goes through. I'm not going to get into the detail because we're going to run out of time tonight, no doubt about it. So with that, I'm going to move on. How secure do you think this tomb was? They put him in a tomb and said they rolled a rock back. How secure do you think it was? Well, the, the Gospel of Matthew describes um, a great stone that was rolled in front of the doorway and uh, so it was pretty secure. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. And just conceptually, from what we get from the historians, and actually, you know, we've been to Israel. We've seen what's supposed to be that tomb. Uh, it is a, a big stone. They even have the stone that's there. But the way, the way they carve out this, this uh, tomb out of rock is they carve it out, and they have different almost compartments in there. The stone... What they do is they carve really a uh, kind of a, a place for the stone to sit, and they roll it back and put a rock in front of the stone so that the, when the stone is rolled back, uh, that's how they can bring the bodies in. But you're rolling the stone back uphill, and if it's hundreds of pounds, you can probably pull the rock out and close it, but opening it is another whole issue. The other thing that we notice in the other gospels, the Marys are coming back to put additional spice to prepare Jesus's body. And they're questioning how in the world we're gonna get, who's gonna remove the stone? So they know that they saw the stone roll down and they were questioning how, how were they gonna get him to remove the stone in order to get in and finish the burial process. And then we also know that the Jewish leaders went to Pilate in begging to put a guards there to make sure that the body was not taken and to make sure it was uh, secured because they re remembered what Jesus said. And we don't get all that in John's gospel. We have to go into to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And one of the things we are doing tonight is we have to get into those other gospels because all of them are a little bit different when it comes to the resurrection. And so they're all valid, but a little bit different. We're going to get into that.
So next question. So what factors give evidence the tomb was truly empty? And there are quite a few. So, I mean, there's a few of them. The first, 1 Corinthians 15, it's a very, very early text. And so it's considered um, reliable. Um, actually, uh, Mark's narrative is also considered very reliable. It was written about AD 37. And so we know that's within about five years. Um, being so soon, um, in that short of a time, following the, the, the event of the crucifixion and the burial and the resurrection, um, it's not long enough where the story's been told and told and accounts have gotten bigger and it's turned into a legend. So they feel it's pretty uncorrupted and they can trust that. The, the tomb, location of the tomb was known to both the Christians. We know that the, the women stood back and they watched where um, Jesus was laid. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus certainly knew since they put him there. Um, but the Jews and the Christians both knew where Christ was laid. And if it wasn't empty, it would have been impossible for this Christian movement to begin in the same city that there really was a body left in that tomb. So this, this, um, this movement began out of um, their saying this, he said he was going to rise from the dead and he did rise from the dead. Um, none of, uh, going back to Mark's, um, Mark's uh, writings, Nobody, none of the eyewitnesses, nobody ever refuted that. Nobody refuted what he said. So that seems like pretty good evidence. Obviously, the Jews would have been all over to refute everything that they could say from what was said. Um, there was no guards that left of the tomb. The stone was removed. The body was gone. Another thing that they find quite interesting is that the grave clothes were very neatly laid in place. Um, they weren't like scattered all over or, you know, in disarray. They were just neatly folded and laying there and um the guards returned we know from matthew there was an earthquake and they were feared and they knew the body was gone the guards went back to the sanhedrin trying to cover you know their backs and report that the body was missing so that report was by the guards it wasn't by some sect trying to get people to believe in something that wasn't true and no no jew claimed that the body was still there. Rather, the Jewish leader's question was, where is the body? So that would not have been their approach, and that's not what they would have said if they felt like the body was really there. So we feel like we're very, very confidently and without question can say this tomb was empty. Yeah, and as Nett put it, uh, we get into the we get into the actual scripture. We haven't even started started the scripture yet. That we're all this is all kind of front end work, but. The fact is, is you will see that the clothes are neatly still there. And when we understand the way they prepare the body for burial, and we'll get into that, it's obvious the physical body went through the clothes. It wasn't undressed. And it's obvious, you know, uh, grave robbers wouldn't have come in and, and took those uh, linen off of it because that's 100 pounds that would have taken too much time. They probably, it, it would have been harder to carry the body. And so there is absolutely... When we get to that, you'll see what comes out of looking in and seeing those grave clothes in the position they are in. But what can, we can I say something sure. about grave clothes? I mean, I don't even know if I've told Dave this, but and I don't know if it's true or not true. And I never worked on it, um, convinced it was true or untrue. I just tried to prove what was going on on these threads. But the linen that was covering him is called. There is a, an artifact called the Shroud of Turin, and. They, I mean, they, we, I read on it again now, but they feel like the, the, clo the, the cloth would have been there and the body would have come through the, clo the clothes and the, and the heat generated by this body transfiguring from on the table through probably left the image. Um, I've, I've worked on threads of that and, and, and trying to identify why this piece of linen is, is um, composed or preserved. And I do know that Fungi and bacteria and things work together and they do, um, you know, they can make this bio layer. And so they code, it's been protected by the organisms and normally that you would expect to destroy it. Very fascinating. And when we're in person sometime, I'll tell you, but um, very, very interesting, the Shroud of Tehran. I don't know if it's real or if it's not real. So the, why we're getting into this and the reason we're getting into this is because this is an area of the gospel. It is the gospel. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. That's all there is. 
That's the gospel of Christ. I mean, obviously, gospel means good news. So we can have gospels of other things. The gospel of Christ is, is those three elements, and, and that's it. But we have all kinds of theories, alternative theories. And I don't know whether you know some of them, but uh, I'll just ask the first question. I mean, do you know some of the alternative theories about Christ really did, wasn't resurrected? Well, the, 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 the Jews wanted to create the narrative, the lie, actually. The disciples came there and stole the body away. Yeah, and that's one of the uh, earliest uh, alternatives to the resurrection. And the Jews actually didn't question somebody stole the body. They didn't know how the body was gone. But when you get into the other gospels, you find out that the guards, when they left, they came to the Jewish leaders, the high priest, and said, the stone's away and the body's gone. So they actually bribed those guards and paid them money. And it said, you were to say that the apostles came, y'all fell asleep, they stole the body and took it. And that was the first, you're right, Robert, that was the first theory, alternative theory, that was around during those times. The guards told the priest, oh, wait a second, if we tell Pilate we fell asleep, you know, we're, we're going to be killed. We can't do that. And the high priest said, don't worry about Pilate. We got him under control. You remember that? They had Pilate by really the hair and said, hey, you do anything, we're going to Caesar, and you're gone. So they controlled Pilate at this point. So they really wasn't concerned, but I think it's, a, it's the uh, Gospel of Mark or, or Matthew that tells us that account of what actually happened when the guards left. But another popular theory that has gone in and out through the last century, some of these are earlier, uh, later uh, theories, is one called the swoon theory. And the swoon theory was, was popular in that they said they came up with some type of concoction that looked and put Jesus like he looked like he died. So it looked like he was dead, but he really wasn't dead. And so when he came down off the cross, and they put him in this cool tomb, and the cool air woke him up, and he went out. As crazy as that is, that was a popular alternative method. Obviously, he wouldn't be walking with two, with his legs broken, with the, no one broken, but with the, the spike between his legs, you know, the spear in his side, the, his hands, his back ripped open. He's not walking around three days after he died doing that. And so that's one theory. The other theory that is funny as well, but it's, that, it's out there, it's real. real. People will, will swear on it. Well, it's a, it was a hallucinations. They, they thought they saw Jesus because he didn't appear to everybody. And we're going to get into why he didn't appear to everybody. may not be this week, but next week. Because Jesus did not appear to anybody. Only, only people we ever appeared to were believers, with the exception of one. You remember who that was? The only non-believer Jesus made himself available to. Paul. The rest were all his believers. So the hallucination theory says, well, if it was one person that did this, that, that's one thing. A person can hallucinate, not day after day, not for 40 days that they saw him, but it wasn't one person. The disciples saw him. The Mary saw him. It was over 500 brothers that saw him. This was all written within probably three, four years of the actual event. So if this wasn't true, people would have been just, there would have been all kinds of documents written that what the, that they were saying was not true. None of, none of that's available anywhere. Another popular, popular theory was the women went to the wrong tomb. The tomb they went to wasn't Jesus' tomb. They were there just the other day. They watched where it was. They knew exactly where it was. John and Peter ran to the tomb when Mary told. John and Peter knew exactly where it was. It was a, a wrong tomb. So if it was a wrong tomb, why would the Jewish guards go tell the priest 
that in the other gospel that, you know, somebody that they fell asleep, don't know how the body, there was an earthquake, the stone rolled away, so forth. And so there's also, you know, the theory that this was fabricated over time. Obviously, we just mentioned Mark's gospel is written way too early after the actual event. Too many people are living that could have, dipped, could have written and discredited what Mark said. And you can find no documentation. But I read an, uh, a, an actual article from a lady that says Christ is not real. He didn't die. He wasn't resurrected. And she goes through all the historical facts of why that's not true. Listing that this Jewish writer never brought it up. Oh, this Jewish writer, Josephus, when, when we talked about him many times, oh yeah, he brought it up, but that was... That was authored later on. That was not his actual document. Where I'm going from here is we have things that have never been reputed. We've been trying to repute it for 2,000 years. And you remember what I said before, and here's some person that probably never, never read the Bible that's going to put out on the Internet that there's no, there's no real facts that Jesus ever existed. And this was about a you know, 10, 15-page document that – you know, had nothing to do with reading scripture, had nothing to do with doing the research. All they did was look at historical documents and said they couldn't find Jesus' name in it. They hung their hat on there and made, made uh, a case of it. But obviously, as we mentioned, the most cru crucial thing here is we have to know that if something happened early on, these facts would have been, been noted. So another thing that people will say, well, the Bible has errors in it. There's discrepancies between the four Gospels. If you read them, they're all different. Um, so does this mean that there's errors in the Bible? So um, we found, I found a chart on the Internet by Chloe Clay. You can find all kinds of them. I just like this one because it fit in our slide well. Um, but let's look at what the discrepancies are. and Let's see if it looks like the Bible really is an error, has errors, or if these discrepancies are not really discrepancies. So first we have the time of day. Well, Matthew says it's at dawn on the first day of the week, and then Mark says it's very early the first day of the week, and then it's early on the first day of the week, and early on the first day of the week. So they all say um, the first day of the week. I think in John it even mentions when, while it's still dark. They all say the first day of the week. So we know that to be um, Sunday. That was their Sunday, the day after Shabbat. Um, and so is these times of day different? Is this discrepant? Well, no. Um, what is it like at dawn? Well, if you're really up at dawn, right, and that's not sunrise, dawn starts before sunrise, the sky is still dark. Um, it is, um, you know, early in the morning. Uh, another thing is these women had been staying in Bethany, and, and if they um, had been traveling from Bethany, that would have been about a two-mile walk. They could have left when it was 4 a.m. and pretty dark, and by the time they got there, it was, light was starting to come over the horizon. Um, you know, so no, they're not listed the same. They're not said exactly the same way, but they all indicate the same thing. The next thing is who went to the tomb? Well, Matthew talks about Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Um, Mark is Mary Magdalene, Mary, James's mother, and Salome. Um, Luke just says the women. They don't mention them. And then John only brings up Mary Magdalene. Okay, is this a big, big error? Like John's missed these people or these people were added by mistake? Does that say that they're wrong? No, um, I don't believe so. I believe that John felt, uh, uh, Mary Magdalene is a very prominent fig, uh, figure person in, in the New Testament, in the gospel accounts. Um, she was uh, healed, but she was, Jesus cast out seven demons. Many, many times you'll try to find people um, kind of hang on her that she was a prostitute, and there's nothing written that says she was a prostitute. There's nothing about that. And so, um, you know, that, that's where, she, you know, but she is a very prominent figure. So Mary Magdalene is definitely mentioned in three of the Gospels. The women aren't named in Luke, but I would imagine why wouldn't she be one of those? Why would he not have her, um, et cetera? Is this a problem? Well, no, it's just guys who are focused on different Marys. Uh, or different, not Mary's, different naming who was there or not naming or feeling what was, you know, there may have been 12 women um, and they're only naming a certain few. Events that occurred during the resurrection. Well, Matthew says it was a violent earthquake. An angel speaks to them and then the women meet Jesus. That's how that one um, is said. 
Um, Mark says the women brought spices to treat the body, but there was an angel speaks to them from inside the grave and they flee from the tomb and they don't say anything. Luke talks about women that take spices to the tomb and an angel appears and the angel speaks to them and they ran back and told the disciples what they found. And then again, Mary Magdalene ran to get Simon and Peter um, and, and John. And they went to the tomb and then the disciples left and then Jesus appeared to Mary. Again, this sounds like they're all quite different, but are they really? Well, not necessarily, it's just John is not listing every single um, fact that Matthew is, um, but they're all, they're all kind of in the same light. So there's a couple more on the next slide. Yeah. yeah, and just to mention, you know, Mary Magdalene is, uh, she was a woman of question. Never, ever is there any support. She was a prostitute. And that rumor got started really early in uh, the Catholic, uh, I, I think it was one of the high Catholic leaders referred to her, even the Pope, like Pope Francis the letter, referred to her that she was a prostitute. And to show you that there's no scriptural background for that, um, it was in 1960 that the Pope then said, he apologized that that was wrongly said and that got spread all over the place that she was and said there was no basis for that, there was no scriptural basis for that, there's no historical, historical basis for it. So he basically apologized and said that was a wrong thing that was said. And that was you know, four or 500 years before he was, he was making up the fact, was apologizing the fact that that was ever said. But she was a, a woman of questionable issues. She had seven demons, I one, seven. And so why God used this woman for where he used her here, we don't know. We're gonna talk about that a little bit if we have time, why God is using women in such strategic places that we don't we don't ever think about, and you know I think some church uh, denominations don't even allow women to be an elder or allow women to to be a, a minister. Uh, but when you look at how prominent they are in in the New Testament uh, and even in the Old Testament, uh, you wonder what's the strategy behind that. But anyway, going on the angels. One in, in Matthew, one angel came down from heaven whose appearance was like lightning, clothes were as white as snow. The young man dressed in, dressed in white robes, sitting on the right side. One man doesn't say two, that's Mark. Luke says two men appeared in clothes that gleamed like lightning and stood beside them. Two angels in, were seated where Jesus' body was in John. It's all, it, it's easy to say one angel when that's the only one talking. And it's easy to say it was two young men dressed in white robes, didn't recognize them as angels. Uh, I'm not sure they would have known an angel from a man. It was bright uh, clothing. So there's nothing here that really contradicts one another. It's different perspective. Now you gotta realize Matthew, Mark, and Luke are getting their interpretations for one of the Marys that were there. They weren't there personally. So this is not a personal experience of them. This is actually a second or third party appearance. John was there. So it's the actual eyewitness of all of them that are there. So as we go through, we do know Mark was Peter's scribe. So you can say Mark and John probably had more firsthand stuff because John and Peter were the first ones to the graves. Actually, John was. We'll talk about that. Jesus' words, in Matthew it says greetings, do not be afraid. You go tell your brothers to go to Galilee and there we will see me. And Mark says the two young men were sitting, he says nothing about Jesus saying anything. Luke says nothing about Jesus saying anything. And then in John it says, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for, Mary? Do not hold yourself to me, for I have yet turned to the Father. I am returning to the Father and to your Father and to my God and you're gone. So with that, we're going to get into some of these discrepancies, but why, why are these discrepancies important and reconcilable? Let me give you some quick answers there. there every scholar 
over the last 2000 years, you know, from the best train has basically collaborated the fact that there's nothing here that contradicts anything. The second thing is if everyone was identical, these are all different witnesses, some eyewitness, some secondhand, some thirdhand witnesses, if all of these were identical, you knew they colluded and came up with a story. This is always the case if you have a trial and you have multiple witnesses that come at it from different approaches, they're gonna get a different testimony. If it's identical, then they got together with one another and say, hey, this is what we're gonna say. And so this differences in the gospel right here is so important to authenticate how real these gospels really are. The writings are real because of the discrepancies between each one, quite, quite common. So if Jesus was put in the tomb on Friday, resurrected on Sunday, how could he be in the grave three days? I mentioned this a little bit last time. Again, this is people trying to shoot holes in what's said in the Gospels. And it's reconcilable from two ways. Uh, choose your way. I'm not going to put my spin on either way. I'm presenting it to you for you to make your own decision, your own study. But one is it's, it is noted Jewish tradition counts a day, any part of that day. So remember, they were in a hurry to get Jesus off the cross because 6 p.m. started Sabbath. 6 p.m. was Friday. 6 p.m. in one second was Sabbath. So if he was if he was in the grave at 5:59 at 6 o'clock or 6:01 that's one day in the grave. All day Sabbath he's in the grave. And then if he's 6 p.m. Saturday night that's now the third day. So did Jesus rise at 7 p.m. at 12 midnight on the next on, on the first day of the week or whatever? It's completely reconcilable when you look at where, how the Jews counted days. The second part of that, and there are some very good scholars that argue this, and that's why I said it's not, I'm not going to do the research because it's not worth my time. I believe Christ was in the, the grave three days, and we'll get why later on, because Christ himself said he would, right? That's the, that's the main reason. But the fact is, is that there's actually two Passovers or two Sabbaths during the Passover. Let me rephrase that. The Passover is really the 14th of Nisan. It's a calendar. It's always on the 14th. The scholars that have done the research and said that the 14th was a Wednesday at 32 AD or 33 AD, wherever it was. Friday, I mean, uh, Thursday was the, fe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Friday until 6 p.m., then, the then, the, then another Sabbath starts. So the 14th as being Passover is, is a technically a Sabbath. The Jewish have, Jews have seven Sabbaths that are not all uh, Saturday. They're spe what's called special or high Sabbath. High Sabbath was the 14th. So it's very likely Jesus could have been crucified on the 15th or crucified on the 14th. He still was going to be in the grave three days. So no matter how you look at this, I want you to be aware of that. Also, people that have studied the scriptures say that at the end of the Sabbath, it's plural. <coughs> Excuse me. If it's plural, it means you're talking about two Sabbaths, not one, which again leans towards a crucifixion on Wednesday, not Friday. So all of this, I just want you to be aware of, so that if you run across these things, just know that it's, you know, good scholars have different opinions. But the fact is, the three days, I'm totally comfortable with, because that's what Jesus said. Okay, let's go to our first scripture passage, verses 1 through 4, John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. 
Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. The first thing I'll say of most of all the pastors and commentaries we look into, listen to kind of found it funny that that John wouldn't name himself, and he always used some, you know, the disciple Jesus loved or the other disciple or whatever he used, but that he was going to put in there that he beat uh, Peter to the grave. He outran him. Um, so that was always kind of a funny chuckle, and I'll just put it in there, but not my own thought. So the first question I have, and this is, there's no way you have an answer for this probably. I mean, some of you might, but what significant events occurred over three days? Why was Jesus in the grave three days? And there's just in history, um, there are a few three day events. First off, from the time that Abraham got the command um, or the direction to perform the sacrifice of Isaac um, and went and built the altar and prepared for that. And from that time of the command to the time that God provided the ram, that was a three day event. It occurred over three days. Um, there's another story about Rahab, the, who was a prostitute. So when the um, pro Joshua, um, who took over for Moses to take the Israelites or the Hebrews into the promised land, sent some spies in to do recognizance of Jericho. So they snuck in there and it found out that the spies were there. And so the men of the city were coming after um, to capture them. And Rahab was a prostitute who had her home built into the, the, the wall. It was, her house was part of the wall, so she could enter it, and it was just part of the wall. And it wasn't unusual for men to come and go from her place, seeing as that was her profession. So the spies ran in there, and she hid them. She put them up on the roof under straw and pitch, and she hid them. And then when they came demanding them and they searched her house and they didn't find them, and, and the angry mob left, she um, released them out of her window over the other side of the wall on a crimson cord. And she told them, look, go into the hills, hide for three days. Don't keep running. They will overrun you. They will find you. Go into the hills, hide three days into the caves. And then after those three days, you'll be free to go back to your camp. And so they did that. There's one other very interesting thing. And I don't want to grasp at straws, but it's just very interesting. I want to present it to you. In Psalm 22, um, Jesus, it mentions that he was a worm and, and no man. And the worm that they used in, in the psalm is called the Tola worm. And this is an interesting worm that when it's on the bark or um, you know, the twig or what it's on, it, it secretes this crimson spot. And um, they used this, this secretion, they used this for um, crimson dyes to, to make very expensive materials. But if he excretes this dot onto the twig, in three days it becomes pure white. And so that is really quite interesting. Um, so when Paul is talking about the creed in Corinthians, he's drawing on these Old Testament scriptures, primarily Rahab, um, Abraham, um, and the Psalms. He's drawing on these scriptures to say that Jesus was buried according to scripture. Yeah, and the other thing, just remember, Jesus himself said, you know, destroy this temple and I will rise it in three days. I will raise it in three days. And then he also, in his scripture, said, as Jonah was in the, the stomach of a well, of a uh, fish for three days, I too will be in the bounds of earth or under earth for three days. So this, this is well documented that these three days were, were significant events. So with that said, why do you think the stone was removed? To allow the disciples to get in, to see that That's exactly ready. right. That's exactly right, Ricky. That's as simple as that. It wasn't moved to allow Jesus out. Jesus went right through the walls. He went right out through the rock. So it wasn't removed for him. It was removed so that we would know the body was gone. Not wasn't removed for Jesus' benefit. So that's exactly right. So how do we know that the body wasn't stolen? And it goes back to those grave clothes. Think about, so Jesus had been enshrouded in the linen, and then they took the, the myrrh, 
and they mm -hmm. put that on him and it made that kind of crusty cast. And so he's sitting there and, and the, the, the claws were just laid out perfectly. Now, if you're a thief and you're going to come in, are you going to take off the cloth, the cloth first? I don't think if I was stealing a body, I want the cloth on there. I wouldn't want to take off the cloth. But if you were going to take off the cloth, and that's how you were going to do it, I think that they'd rip them off and throw them off and they'd be scattered here and about. They're not going to be perfectly laid out as if the body just came through or neatly folded because Jesus unwrapped it from his face. That was going to be my answer. Which one? That, that one you just answered. You did good. That was going to be my answer. Okay, good, good. That, yeah, 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 so, yeah, you did good. Thank yeah. you, thank you. You're welcome. Um, validation, that's great. So, so we, we know that the, I mean, these things just don't make sense. The way the, the crime scene, if it was stolen, the way it was laid out makes no sense that the body was stolen. So, we, we don't feel like any, there's any evidence of that. Okay, the next question. Do you think the Jewish leaders feared a resurrection? I think so because they had spent the last three years basically uh, vehemently uh, doing everything they could to discredit Christ and destroy him. Uh, and if he really did rise from the dead, that would solidify <laughs> that he truly was the son of God sent from heaven, the savior of the world, everything he said he was. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, that's, that's exactly right. They feared the resurrection because if that did happen, but you do, you think they believed that he would, re would occur a resurrection and what they believe again, this is according to commentators. I don't have any thing in scripture I can point to, is they thought since Christ raised Lazarus from dead that he could raise himself, but it would be by the powers of hell, of evil, of Satan. It wouldn't be from God because they did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. And they did not understand that the first time Messiah came, he came to suffer for us, not as a military fighter to take and uh, take over Rome. So I'm going to have Dave, well, I'm going to go to the next scripture section and I'm going to have Dave kind of look at us. We might be stopping after this and not continuing on um, because we have a lot of material and it's great stuff and we don't want to try to rush through it, but I'm going to have him kind of look and see what he thinks where we're going to stop. So let's look at verses five through 10. And remember that I ended last time with John um, got there and was waiting for Peter. So it said, and, and John, that's, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. And then the disciples went away again to their own homes. My question is, why didn't John enter the tomb when he first got there? Any ideas? I think he was afraid. Okay. And that's a really good idea. That's a, that's a really good point. So he was not, he was letting us know that he outran Peter, but you don't know, think about, about John. John was supposedly younger. We don't know for certain, but he seemed to be more, he was more of a teen or a young teen. Um, Peter probably would have been up in his thirties. Um, so number one, maybe he got to the grave and wouldn't go inside because he was afraid, you know, he may have been worried about defiling himself. You know how the Jews were very, um, very adamant about defiling, being around dead bodies or dead things and defilement. He might have been worried about doing that. It could have been out of respect. I mean, Peter really did step out as a leader um, in, in, of, the, of the apostles. He really was one of the main ones, one of John's or, or Jesus's inner circle. And it could have been that he was waiting for him as the boss or as the leader, that, that he would be the first one. We don't know why. Um, there's all kinds of reasons. All we know is that 
um, John, who tended to be a little bit more hesitant and looking in, Peter, true to his personality, he didn't take any time. He didn't pause. And look at it. Peter just busted right in there to look around and see what's happening. Um, and so um, that is what we know. Um, whatever, it, whatever it was, it, he could look in there and see that there was no body, but he did not really have, uh, we don't have a reason exactly why he wouldn't do that. Certainly he could have been doing it. The tomb would have been, you had to finagle to get yourself in there the way it was cut out. And um, I mean, maybe he was worried about getting in there and then Peter wouldn't have been able to, we don't know. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's just, um, that is a question. So uh, why, why do you think John says that after seeing the grave clothes, he believed? The only thing I can come up with is that, um, you know, that he believed that he was resurrected. And Jesus did tell the disciples, uh, you know, during his time with them uh, in ministry, uh, that, that he would be crucified and, and resurrected. And I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, John recollected that. Yeah, and that's true. And I think most of the, the disciples, uh, including the Marys, uh, was not expecting a resurrection. So, Rob, you're right. While Jesus said many times that he is going to die and he is going to be resurrected, the his disciples really didn't get that. It's not that they... Un, they were of unbelief. They could have been, uh, but the fact is they really didn't get it. But we got to realize something that John is probably the, I'd say the most educated, most trained, most of the upper class of the disciples. And I say that without any record. It's my own opinion. Because when you look at the disciples, disciples, you know, many of them were fishermen. Uh, many of them, and John was a fisherman as well, but he came from a different family. So it talks about, you know, he having connections with the Pharisees and the high priest. That was why he would, that was why he was allowed to go in. If you remember, then he came back and got Peter. So he, he was connected. He was probably more informed of what the Old Testament said. But let's look at these other disciples. Do you think they really knew the Old Testament? And the fact is, remember, you didn't have printing presses. You didn't have a Bible. The only people that had the Bible, and not, it was only a few, would be really the Pharisees who would study the Bible. And then they would teach others what the Bible said. So these men didn't have access to anything other than what the Pharisees told them about. And they probably had some access to Jesus, obviously, because Jesus knew the whole Old Testament inside and out. And he probably used these three years doing a lot of teaching. But you can understand they're Jewish, and they still don't quite grab it all. But when John goes in and sees the way the clothes are there, there are some that really say John is stating right here, he believes in the resurrection. And he said twice he was the first one to the tomb. So he was the first one to the tomb of the disciples. He was also the first one to believe that Christ was resurrected. And I say the first one to believe, that's the first one over everyone. Because remember, next week we're going to get into the next set section of Scripture which Mary comes back after she tells him, and she's going to be there at the tomb. And it's amazing how we find out that Mary is the first eyewitness of the resurrection. And why does God use her? That'll be an interesting topic for next week. And so we will probably not try to tackle anything in 21 next week, but try to finish 20. Uh, and take our time getting through this last piece. This is so important to our foundation, to your understanding, and for your ability to refute or rebut people who 
don't do the study and don't do the research and have all kinds of false except false speculations as whether there was a resurrection or not. So I, I think we really need to take our time. I do have one thing I want to say about John um, believing after seeing the grave clothes. It's just as Dave said, um, it's like um, John saw the grave clothes and he's like, he did rise from the dead, but he's the only one. So, so our belief should be like John's belief um, in Christ, like it's as he said, because the rest of the disciples, nobody else believed um, until they saw Christ. None of the other apostles believed until they actually saw him. But John got belief before, so we want that to be a, a, an example to us in our belief. So we're gonna, you're gonna, you've got some foreshadowing of what we're gonna talk. We'll start with verses 11 through 13, and we'll continue on hopefully through the end of the chapter here next week. And right now we will be at wrap up. I think we're pretty much wrapped up, unless there's any other comments or questions, and we'll have a closing prayer. Good session tonight. Thank you, Dave and Ed. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. It, it went okay with us being remote, so that's that's encouraging. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll use the prayer. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Mickey, hey, Annie, see y'all. Welcome. Good to see you. Are you still in Arkansas? Or are you back home? No, she said they were back home. Oh, they're back home. No, okay. we're in Arkansas. Oh, y'all oh, are? Arkansas. Okay. 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 Well, let's close in prayer, and then we can catch up a little bit very quickly. Our dear Heavenly Father, praise God you are risen. I praise you that you gave us uh, a lamb, a sacrificial lamb that was obedient, that followed you, that followed your will, who hung on the cross, who died, um, who went into the grave, and then who rose to give us uh, eternal life, a chance at eternal life through him. Uh, a direct bridge to the Father. We thank you. Um, I thank you for the study tonight. I thank you for each person that was able to join us. And I just pray that you would um, help us reflect on this. This is not mm, mm, trivial things. This is These are important questions. And the world will come at us with these denials and these faults. And I just pray that this is our weapon. This is our tool to to give your truth and state your truth. And we will remember these. It's very interesting stuff. And I just thank you for bringing it together in the sources we've found. It's, it's a wonderful blessing, and we thank you, dear God. Please be with us um, throughout this week. Be with the prayer request. You know the concerns of our heart. You know these dire circumstances, and I pray you would be with them. We praise you and thank you for all your goodness, um, all that you do for us, and especially for your son. In Jesus' amazing, wonderful, holy name, amen. God bless. Safe travel.